Hey Bailey, have you ever thought about building your own airplane? You know I have, but I don't even know where I'd begin. Okay, well let's find out today in the hangar. Welcome to In The Hangar, I'm Christy Wong. And I'm Bailey Ward. And of course we want to start this episode off by thanking our sponsors, all of which are linked below. Christy, what are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to be talking about building airplanes and how we can do that legally. Ooh. All right, well we've got a special guest today. We've got Greg from Vans Aircraft. Greg, thank you so much. It's great to meet you. Hi. Hi. First of all, what is your position within VAMS? Uh, I'm the vice president of VAMS Aircraft. Oh my gosh. Chief operating <laughs> officer. It's nowhere near as uh, glamorous or important as it sounds. But, um, right. Well, if we want to build an airplane, you're the guy we want to <laughs> yeah. talk to. Yeah, well, well, probably. Um, <laughs> there, there's a number of companies out there that do what we call kit airplanes or home-built airplanes, and ours is one of them. It's We're the largest. I was gonna say, you guys are by far the largest, yeah, We're right? the largest manufacturer of airplane kits in the world. Oh. There's more than 11,000 of our airplanes that flown, and there's even more than that being built out there in the world. Okay, the world so are right you now. guys the reason why EAA exists? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's a very strong mutual relationship, though. Um, gotcha. The, the home-built uh, aircraft industry and the manufacturers that uh, design and build the kits so that you can build an airplane at home, um, we're a pretty tight knit group. You know, we all work well together. Kind of a, it's kind of a spirit of cooperation, I guess, is the, I like the lingo that we use sometimes. A, a long time ago, you know, several decades ago, the government came up with a way based on some uh, pressure by citizens who were really into home building airplanes and were kind of outlaws at the time. Um, but then there was a formal sort of process put in place and a, and a way to be able to allow home building to be legal and for the purpose of education and hobby, learning type of things. And since then, it's just grown and grown. It used to be that if you wanted to build an airplane, it, was, it wasn't really achievable for a lot of people because you would have to get great big sheets of paper and go and get metal or wood or whatever it was and figure out how to cut it and what shape it needed to be. And you would be fabricating it from scratch with raw materials. Nowadays, it's really changed. Now we have kits that we produce all the parts and they're all bent and they have all the holes where the rivets go and all the different, they just sort of fit together. Uh, and it goes together much more quickly. So the so, industry has really changed over time. Let's say Bailey and I want to build an airplane together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, what would be our first step? Well, the first thing you'd want to do is decide what your mission is. Like, what do you want to do with the airplane? Right? What do There's we want to do with the airplane? Hmm. Do you want to go upside down? Do you just want yeah. to use it for like... Yeah, or forth? maybe like one to jump out of? Oh my goodness. <laughs> experimental <No>. arrow. <laughs> you can go jump out of airplanes, but not experimental airplanes. There's an experimental uh, class actually doesn't allow skydiving, right? Not without oh. special permission. So, But we do upside down. We do a lot of upside down airplanes at Vans Aircraft. Uh, cool. And there are kit airplanes for a variety of different missions. So you can uh, single seat airplanes, four seat airplanes, uh, really common two seat airplanes. So I guess mm. we should ask what type of kits does Vans offer? So we, Vans Aircraft makes all metal, um, typically low wing, high performance. Uh, we, we say total performance. So an airplane that can go really fast and get you there is real light and harmonious on the controls, but also can fly very uh, clean and very stable at low speeds and can land and take off in fairly short distances. So that's the total performance package, if you will. We have airplanes all the way from the original, the first uh, commercial model, the RV3, which is a single seat aluminum airplane. Wait, what happened to the RV1 and 2? Well, the RV1 <laughs> actually started life as a Stitz Playboy, which prior to the existence of Vans Aircraft, so Dick Van Grunsven is the founder of Vans Aircraft, and hence the name. <clears> hey, <throat> Vans, I see the connection. Yep, there you go. And he had um, uh, an airplane called a Stitz Playboy, and it was not the highest performing airplane. It was at the time in the experimental world, um, it was considered to be one of the higher end airplanes, but he wanted it to be better. And he set out to do modifications to this to this Stitz Playboy uh, so that he could make it faster and so he could make it handle better. And um, that became what he, because it was really no longer a Stitz at that point in time, it was really sort of a one-off airplane. So he just started calling it the RV-1. Richard Van Grunsven, RV-1. Oh. So that's, that's where that comes from, see? <laughs> so, and that airplane, people saw it and they were like, wow, that's really cool, you know? I mean, maybe I'd like to try to do that sometime. But Van also got to the point with that airplane where he really couldn't take it any further. In order to take it 
and do everything else that he had in his mind based on what he had learned in improving the flying qualities and the performance of that airplane, knew that he'd have to do a clean sheet design. And that was the RV-3. What happened to the two? The RV-2, as uh, Vans explained it, it's, it was an all wood uh, design with a flying wing. So, and, and it, was, okay. it was abandoned. So abandoned we don't talk about ago. the two is what I'm hearing. Yeah, so the RV-1 <laughs> yeah. RV was never <laughs> intended to be a commercial thing. In fact, it was before the concept of having a business was even there. But the RV-3, when Van built it, and people saw it, and he flew it to Oshkosh, right? Or flew it to the convention. And when he got there and people saw it, they said, how can I get one of those? And that's sort of how it all started was people said, I want to be able to build that airplane, the one that Van is flying upside down in the air show. Um, take your upside down. Right? And, and, and I want to be able to do that. So he started, drew up plans and some really basic instructions and started providing what people would need to go and get the materials to build the airplane. And that kind of evolved over time to, well, we'll make some parts. So maybe we'll make some parts and we'll even bend them a little bit. But, but the... The, the aircraft designs evolved, so it started as a single-seat RV-3. People wanted two seats, so the, the RV-4 is a tandem version of the same shape of airplane. Then, then people flying with their significant others, their husbands or wives, they didn't want to sit one behind the other. They wanted to sit next to each other so they could gaze into each other's eyes as they fly off into the sunset <laughs> well, yeah. on a romantic I mean, cool. flight. That's yeah. what we want, yes. I think. Yeah. So the RV-6 is a side-by-side airplane. And that evolved into the Wait, RV. Wait, what happened to the RV-5? Oh, the, uh, the RV-5 exists. So it actually exists, and it's presently being restored uh, okay. in Aurora, Oregon, which is where our factory is. What does it look like? Is it a tandem, a side-by-side, -side, a single? Um, if you search for it on the Internet, you can find pictures. We took it to Oshkosh to Air Venture a couple of years ago. Um, it is, it's a homely-looking airplane. Okay. That's about what I would say. It was actually done uh, EAA Chapter 105 in Hillsborough, Oregon, which is just outside of Portland. Uh, some members there in Van <clears throat> did it as a project. It was during the 70s, during the gas crisis, which is way before your time, right? Like, but, what? Oh, that's before <laughs> my time. Yeah, that's really before it's, my time. It's not quite before my time. <laughs> but but the, the gas crisis, so, and the idea was, can we get a, a smaller, lighter, more efficient engine and build a really light airplane and maybe something where that had a scissor wing, a, you know, a rotating wing, so that you could roll it up onto a trailer and take it home. Oh, that's interesting. That okay, we're going to find a picture and we're going to put it for sure. There. It's an unusual looking airplane, but okay. it still exists and it's actually being restored and will probably fly, well, we were hoping last year, but we've kind of run out of time yeah. with all the business stuff going on. So sometime in the next year or so, okay. hopefully that'll fly. So then the six was a side-by-side. -side. The seven is the, is the more refined, more modern design. Okay. So as we started with these kits that are, um, I guess you just call them... Uh, fairly rudimentary from a construction perspective. You would have to build a jig, right? So you build a whole structure, specific measurements, so that you could then take the airplane parts that you fabricated and fit them on there and make sure that they all fit exactly and take the right shape, right? So it's like you have to build this thing in order to build the airplane onto it. Right, build the thing to build the things. <laughs> so okay. more modern airplane kits now are all what we call uh, pre-punched, because um, it's all metal sheets that are punched on a computer-controlled punch press that cuts and punches holes in it. Pre-punched matched hole, which means the holes are in all the parts and their final size, which means you can basically just take the parts, bring them all together, and start clamping them together. The, the RV-7 is pre-punched matched hole, not final size. Okay, so the six wasn't, but the seven is. The seven, the seven was taking that to the, to the next level. Next level, can. gotcha. And it replaced the RV-6. The RV-6 uh, was and still is, by a long shot, the most, uh, the most built and flown uh, experimental aircraft wow. in the world. Okay. Um, so the RV-7 replaces that. The RV-8 is like a big RV-4. So we talked about tandem versus side-by-side. -side. So it went back to the tandem, but it was mm -hmm. just beefier. And the RV-8 actually was came out before the RV-7 did. So I always have to decide <laughs> what order we talk about these. In. Yeah. Uh, but the RV-8, if you think about it, it's like the RV-4. It's like a big RV-4. Got it. Four times two is eight. Okay. So there you uh, go. Okay, that would make that sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Why? So then they went backward to seven. Exactly. Right. So far, all the aircraft that we've talked about are aerobatic airplanes, right? Okay. They're capable of doing aerobatics, go upside down, plus six minus three Gs. Okay. So what about the nine? The nine is not is the first one that's not aerobatic. Ooh. So the RV nine, if you take an RV seven 
fuselage and put a different wing on it, which is a little thicker and a longer wing and is more efficient and can go to really high altitudes on a smaller engine and, and really, really go. So it's a side-by-side? Side-by-side. Side. Okay, the 10. The 10 is a four-seater. Yeah, okay. Yes. So this is one of those, uh, uh, the, in the evolution, this is a pretty big step in the evolution of the different models. But you can, you can sort of see how one grew from the other and then transformed to the next. Mm -hmm. So the 10 had a lot new in it. Um, it's a big uh, composite, so a fiberglass cabin top um, and four seats. It is a, a, a true four-person airplane. You can put four actual people in it and actually fill it up completely with fuel, throw some baggage in the back and go flying. And, so and not wow. like a 172 yes. where you can put like two, exactly. maybe three people yeah, exactly. in it, maybe a couple bags. <laughs> yeah. So there's a difference between a four-seat airplane and a four-person airplane. Gotcha, so okay. So the RB10 is a true four-person airplane. Performs, right. It's fast. It gets in nice and short. It, it, it does everything that an RV should do. So what about the 11? So the 11 actually exists. Um, not many people have seen it, but it I was going to say, exists. I've never seen an 11, so. No, well, yeah, but it's, it's never flown. It's not finished. Well, so see, that's Van, why, then. Van started, yeah, a, started an airplane project to build uh, basically a, a motor glider. Type okay, of thing. we're and, good. And the 11, the more of a More <laughs> of a personal project than a commercial type of project. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I know the 12 exists. We'll see if yeah. he finishes that or not. The RV-12 is our light sport airplane. And it seems like the hot rod right now. Well, it's the slow one, right? Really? So it turns out, so it's a very popular one. The RV-12 is um, an airplane, all of our other airplanes you do make with solid rivets. So they're rivets that you either squeeze or you use a, a rivet, rivet gun, gun and a bucking bar mm -hmm. and you do it that way, you know, and that, all of that from back in World War II is when that was really became the way to build airplanes, right? Um, the RV-12 is pop rivets, or pulled rivets is, is the technical name. Pop rivet is a trade name. But it's rivets that you, you line everything up and it's pre-punched match hole and their final size, which means it's less work that you have to do before you start actually putting the rivets in the okay, airplane and attaching to things that to is. each other. So that's, we have final size holes, that's, that's what that really Final size tell. holes, okay, <laughs> yes. we'll keep that in mind. So you put these... Uh, pulled rivets in there, you take a rivet gun, like a, maybe an air gun, chunk, 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 goes together really fast. So the RV-12 cool. is a light sport airplane, right? Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, in fact, really fast to build. Um, very, fast very nice seven. airplane, very quick. A couple months? Uh, so an airplane <laughs> project, if you're talking, you know, some, a typical airplane project, a lot of the more modern kits, you're, you know, 1,400 hours or somewhere in there, the RV, 12 is more like a seven or eight hundred dollar oh, oh, wow. project. Yeah, so it's a significant difference. Gotcha. What about the 13? We, uh, there is no such thing as the 13. Oh, really? you know what? I had a feeling. Because bad people, number. yeah, people it's always skip 13. Now, how is it bad luck? <laughs> That's right. They, I know. They're going to have a 13th airplane anyway. They think they're going to bypass yeah. that by naming well, it. Well, from yeah. my perspective, whether it's bad luck or not, it's a bad decision. That's okay. what it comes down to, right? So, I mean, if 10% if of the people aren't going to fly an airplane that's number 13, then why would you even build a number Exactly. 13? See, I would fly it. So we skip to yeah. the 14. Okay. <laughs> the 14 is like the RV-7, a side-by-side -side airplane, but it's, it's more designed for what we'd probably just call, like, the modern American. Okay. It, so it's mm. bigger. Right. The it's, modern American. Yeah, so it's a little, it's That's a little terrible. bit bigger. <laughs> We're calling it the chunky. We also call it, we also call it the Bubba 7. The Bubba yeah, 7. Yeah, but in That's reality, good. it has more in common with the RV-10 from, okay. from an engineering perspective than it does the RV-7. It has uses the same airfoil as the RV-10, just the, the wing is a little shorter. In fact, the part numbers between the, of the parts that are inside the wing, between the 14 and the 7, or 14 uh, and the 10, uh, are actually the same parts. So it's the same parts used in both airplanes. Um, the RV-14 is, so if you think of the RV-7 as like the Camaro, you know, maybe, uh, think of the RV-8, the tandem is maybe it's, I mean, maybe it's the Corvette, I don't know. Um, and the 7 is the Mustang or the Camaro. The, the 14 is, it's the Raptor, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a truck. But it's gotcha. a sports car. Okay. But it's a truck. You know, All right. Kind of thing, so. Now the 15 is completely different from my understanding. So the 15, there's one in the world that's flown, and that's our engineering prototype. So that's the one that's currently under development, in which we announced at Oshkosh uh, and flew to Oshkosh and revealed the prototype in uh, 22. Uh, and we're currently, our engineering team is hard at work on the development of this airplane. And this is a, this is a major departure from, uh, we're taking everything we know, but it's a high wing airplane. Mm 
all of our other airplanes are low-wing airplanes. Mm, so yeah. this this one, and I'm really excited about this one. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to building this. This is an airplane that you can take to unimproved surfaces, so it doesn't have to be an airport or a runway, for example. So go land it out in the dirt, put big tires on it. Oh, that's uh, fun. So van takes backcountry. Back, yeah. yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's, yeah. an, it's an all-metal, high-wing, backcountry airplane oh. is what it is. That's really. Is it going to be a tailwheel, or can it, it be is. either? Well, so initially it's a tailwheel. So yes, tailwheel, right. tailwheel is the initial design. Um, that'd be the RV-15. The RV-15A, which is the, the right. vernacular that we use to describe the tricycle model of the same model, um, will happen, um, but it's not going to be uh, initially. Um, and it could still be used for backcountry, but we also think it could make a really great trainer. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, now we have the full lineup. We yeah. have a lot of decisions to make. Mm. Uh, <laughs> talk to us about Mosaic. Mosaic is an initiative that is underway. Um, it's using a, an industry, an international standard. So there's a committee, an ASTM committee called uh, F37, a, a really a, a, a very engineering and nerdy name, but <laughs> that's the name of the committee. And what they uh, uh, do is they define the light sport standard. So the current standard for light sport aircraft, that is defined by F37. And then the FAA, and other organizations that are similar to the FAA around the world adopt that standard and make that the standard under which light sport aircraft can be operated and built and what have you in the oh. United States. So we can build the RV-12. We have the kit, or which is ELSA, Experimental Light Sport. And then there is SLSA, which we build at our factory and deliver as a flyaway airplane. So it's done, it's been tested, it's painted. You fly it home, that's SLSA. So the light sport um, process for certification is um, more performance driven and is more industry driven as opposed to part 23 that's used to certify you know like a Cessna or Piper or Mooney or something like that. Um, so it's it's lighter weight there's nowhere near as much bureaucracy involved. Mosaic is the modernization of airworthiness certification for uh, general aviation type of airplanes. And so it takes that light sport standard, the F-37, and expands the scope of that to bigger and faster airplanes. So things that would, would encompass all of the models that we make, for example, from a size and a speed and a capacity perspective. And then uh, also will likely expand what the definition of a sport pilot from a privileges perspective for a sport pilot. So there's a number of things. If you were to build your own airplane today and you decided you wanted to build an RV-14, for example, or an RV-15, um, then you would, um, you would build it in a category called experimental amateur built. And experimental amateur built is going back to the original, how did experimental aviation get started and why can I build an airplane? It's about education and what have you. And the rule says that it needs to be at least 51% built by amateurs, one or more people who are amateur builders, not professional builders, right? Not a factory, for example, or not somebody you hire to build it. So that 51% rule goes away when you start putting the light sport rules on aircraft certification. So what that means is that you could, uh, I as a manufacturer could build that airplane to 90% and you could do 10% of that. You could hire somebody to build the airplane for you. But it, it loosens that up and it makes it, um, it still keeps it tight from a safety perspective, but it provides a variety of other options. You've mentioned experimental quite a bit. What is the primary differences between experimental versus certified aircraft? So a certificated aircraft is certified under Part 23 of the Federal Air Regulations, right? Uh, the experimental category is, you know, there's, a, there's a number of different subcategories to experimental. Our kits are under what's called Experimental Amateur Built, or EAB, right? And um, that allows you to build an airplane and then have it examined and inspected at the end of your build process uh, by either an FAA representative or what's called a designated airworthiness representative, which is like somebody the FAA anoints or a DAR, a D-A-R, to, to take a look at your airplane and do the paperwork and check it and make sure that it doesn't look like, like you're gonna die in it, right? <laughs> I mean, in other words, is it properly constructed and does it appear to be airworthy? Um, and so that certification process is, for experimental, is one where um, uh, you can do the build, 
they can sign it off and then you can also apply after that separately to the FAA to say I know enough proof, I know enough about building this airplane that I can maintain it and I can do the annual inspection on it and sign that off. Oh, okay. And I've been told that's not called an annual inspection, it's a condition inspection. It's a condition inspection. Oh, it's right. still annual, but it's an right, annual exactly. condition Right, exactly. You do it inspection. annually. Yeah. They right. just don't call it an annual because it's an experimental aircraft. Ah, so. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, talk to us about your STEM incentives. STEM initiatives, yeah. Yes. So um, we, our company works very closely with schools, and other organizations, typically nonprofit organizations, that are doing science, technology, or engineering, and math type programs, STEM programs, right? And uh, what we do is we have a discount program for them, for example, and there have been well over 100 RV-12 kits that have been built and are being built um, by typically high schoolers, teenagers, all around the world. Yeah, I was about United to say, States. my middle school, who, wh whose aviation program actually developed into the high school aviation program, yeah. had been discussing that and taking an RV-12 and building it through vans. So that's yeah. really interesting. So I had the privilege of being involved with a program, you know, in the Portland, Oregon area where we are called Teen Flight. And the first, the very first uh, teen built airplane uh, was the Teen Flight program, which actually, it was actually, that one was actually built at Vans Aircraft. And then separate to that, they moved to a, different location at the Hillsboro Airport. But so Teen Flight One was built by uh, Scott McDaniels, who just recently retired from Vans Aircraft, and he led uh, and other adult mentors. And then I got involved a, a couple airplanes later. And that's actually how I got involved in experimental aviation. And I learned about it. I was a pilot already, and I, I owned a Cherokee, right? And that was from, Oh, hey, from, <laughs> shout out. Four Taurus of the Skies, right? Yeah, right. So, <laughs> solid airplane. Um, but, you know, we, I got involved in that, and I caught the bug, and uh, and you know, and it just has pretty much directed my life since. To what? Be where can um, school directors or people interested in those STEM initiatives? Where can they go if they want more information on that? So we have we have a STEM page on our website Perfect. for educational initiatives, and and we on there we will link that below for people. Sounds great. Um, and if people go there, you'll also find links to different programs that help facilitate that. So there are some small programs that have one location. And there are also some programs such as Eagle's Nest, uh, Tango Flight is a really big program that's, that's deeply involved and has a whole curriculum for schools that wow. can be adopted by the schools and they can work with the school boards uh, to help set that up. Um, you know, but those programs are terrific because uh, kids that get involved in that, you know, they're learning the mechanics and the hands-on skills, but they're also learning things like teamwork, uh, and stick to and communication and, uh, you know, engineering concepts and a whole variety of Discipline. things. Discipline. Yeah, Discipline. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Commitment. You know, yeah, think, sure. things, real world things that are really valuable. So that's the most exciting. It's fun to build an airplane, um, you know, but we're not just building airplanes, we're building kids and building people. Right? So well, it's a, like it's that, building people. Yeah. That's not creepy. <laughs> Don't use that as a slogan. No, no. <laughs> but but, but, the, but the, the, the experience that these young people have in these programs, um, in many, many cases, has taken them to places that they never would have gone if they hadn't had that experience in building, building an airplane hands-on with people that help them learn how to do that. Okay, so on a serious note, yeah. if you buy and build an RV, do you have to fly in formation? No. <laughs> do you have to join the RV cult? Because that's definitely what it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, so we have a terrific community of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, look at so that. I wouldn't call it a cult. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let me touch on that really quick because <clears throat> building an airplane is something that, you know, when people are thinking about doing, can be kind of intimidating to think about. Um, but the community of people that have built and fly RVs are some really terrific people. Um, and so if you're ever thinking about building an airplane, your local EAA chapter and other people that have built airplanes that you know, um, I know sometimes when you're getting started, especially in aviation, and this is really not just RVs, but in aviation in general, um, it can be a little bit intimidating, you know, especially for the kid at the fence, right, to actually go up and say something to somebody. Go up and say something because the people that are building those airplanes and flying those airplanes, they're the same people that you are. They're the ones that every time they heard that noise overhead, their mind went blank they and their up, nose went up yeah. there and they looked up in the sky and are like, whoa. You know, I can't even argue with that. That's That's so so we, yeah. we have, the best part of my job is 
the people that have built and flown RVs because there's some really terrific, awesome, really, really great people out there. And the community is a very giving community. If you have questions and you ask, I'll bet you're gonna get answers. You might, you might get more than one answer, but you're gonna get answers, there's no doubt about that. Um, and it's, it's really um, probably the biggest and most valuable part of what we've done. Is um, you know is that we've built a product, but that's all that we really do. The community has taken it and made it what it is. Awesome. Well, that's really great information. Bailey and I have a lot to think about when considering <laughs> which airplane we want to build. Absolutely. All right, you guys. If you're considering building an airplane, or if you'd like to get your local school involved in one of these STEM initiatives, we've got a link below to the band's website. Please check it out. Um, who else do we want to thank for, for this? Of course, we have to thank our sponsors, all of which, again, will be linked below. And keep in mind, guys, that all of those companies are ran by pilots. We like to keep it in the family here and uh, keep it in the family of aviation. Yeah, they're good people. And they're also Why people. wouldn't you want to support them? Come on. <laughs> all right, guys, we'd also like to thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share our content, and we'll see you next time in the hangar. <laughs>